All right, champion. So here's a tricky bit. We're prepping the hardware on the new board now. So these have these little um, peened over standoffs. They're like little rivets. We can't reuse them because once you drill them out, you've lost the lip and won't hold on. And fucked if we're going to try and hold these things while we reassemble this uh, abortion of a design. So what we got is M3 nutserts. So I'm going to use them. I've done a test when I designed this board and checked at what height they finish once once riveted or whatever you want to call it, expanded. And they end up about the same as the old ones, almost bang on. So we're going to use them with some new metric screws because these are the old uh, Imperial PVs. And see how she do. So I say this is a tricky bit because uh, now we need a tool that maybe not everyone has. So this is... A small light duty nut cert. I keep calling them nut certs, that's what we call them here. Nut cert gun. It's got a stop, end stop, and it's got a set screw, which sort of works. Put that through there. Comes out the front. You set this where you want it. The amount of expansion that you want. Sort of got to do it by feel so you don't do it too hard. So we'll do the first one. See how that feels and then adjust the gun to suit. So you put this in and using the little thumb screw at the back, just thread it in. Oh, it's smarter to do that before you put it on, eh? Set it so it's just poking through the back. No point going further than that. Put it in the assembly. Make sure you've got the right side. Pull the trigger. Get your pocket on your jumper cord on the bias pot. Think about swearing and then decide against it. Ream it over. Gently let go. Unthread it. Inspect. Check that it's tight. Swear if it isn't and do it again. Check that it's reasonably straight. Swear at Panasonic for focusing on the mat instead of the subject. Think about going to have lunch because it's all too hard. And try again. <laughs> so there's a finished product. See how it's sort of like bellied over there? It's gone at a bit of an angle, which isn't great, but hopefully that's adequate. Just have a look at the height comparing to the old ones. And we're about maybe a, maybe half a mil taller. It looks more dramatic there because it's reflecting off the board too, but we're pretty well there. We'll just try to do the next one a bit straighter. How about we don't do it on camera this time? And I might actually get it right. Alright, so they've all ended up a bit straighter, so I think I might redo that first one. Just consider it a practice run. But overall, it's much easier than trying to get this origami piece of shit back in the chassis and hold bloody standoffs in the right spot and everything. And for the cost of a couple of nut certs and some new screws, I think uh, it's the way to go. Here we go, I've redone the first one, it's a bit straighter now. Just drill it out and redo it like a rivet, carefully. Uh, but I think that's gonna work for us. It's always interesting, <laughs> interesting, simulating mass production methods with the tools you can get and comfortably use, as well as the hardware you can get uh, for your average small shop. But I think that's a good solution. And I plan to probably do that again. So next we've got these little brackets. Could reuse these or you could get more on order. Uh, the issue is these have one side threaded and one side not threaded. Because uh, then the screw can pass over the rivet. So you might have to play with some screw lengths or 
you know, find one that's like you're gonna tr struggle to get a nut on both screws there because it's so small. So I might try and re rivet this one, although I think my rivets are probably too big. They're probably gonna bump into that screw as well. You can see there's not much room there. So let me have a think about it and I'll see you when I've come up with the solution. So here's the solution. Former me found these on DigiKey and bought them. So that's just what we need. You've got threaded on one side, not threaded on the other. And almost identical centers. Perfect. So because I'm just hacking this one together, I might save them for future boards. So if someone did need a board, I could send them one out with them attached and the nut certs and they could populate the rest. So we might drill these out because we're a sucker for punishment today. But yeah, there's the code if you need some. So now you're going to buy them all out and I won't be able to get any more. Being spark fun, you can probably get them direct from them as well. Mmm, primo hackage. Mm -mm -mm. Ow. Huh. Thought I felt something sticky. Must have cut myself on something. I don't even know what. <laughs> uh, cut the hedge out the back of my place the other day, so blood's nothing new. Had to take about three foot off the bastard. No, well, that wasn't too bad. Just tapped him out in the bench vice with the, uh, the pin punch and just popped right out. Now I'm going to clean up these shavings because metal shavings on the electronic bench just irks me. Just freaks me the hell out. Well, lucky me, I'm down to my last three three millimeter rivets. So I've got the old cheapo, shitty, no name rivet gun that everyone seems to have in the hammer tone finish. Must be a factory that just makes these in China somewhere. They're terrible, but I don't use rivets that often, so it's sort of like a stapler. Maybe shit, but you just put up with it. <laughs> Does the job. Worry about it next time. Right, so if you don't know how to use a rivet gun. So we're going this way. So obviously the valve sockets are pointing out the chassis and the U shape is within the chassis. And we'll go rivets this way just like on the other one. That should clear the screw. Of course you could, you could flip them around the other way, I guess. That way you're guaranteed it'll fit. I just like the idea of the the shoulder being against the fiberglass. This is the kind of violent bit. Oh, so I don't know. Always scares you. That clears the screw hole, only just, but it does. Cool, on to the next one. Clear some space, eh? I always do that, I end up with shit everywhere. Right where I'm trying to work. And it's frustrating. So two out of three, ain't bad. And they're nice and sturdy. Can't move them. I don't know whose hands they develop these for, but like, some kind of giant Sasquatch type figure. So there we go. I mounted the one of the ceramics to the other side of the board because I couldn't lay it over because it was between two resistors and it was going to clash with the uh, with the chassis. That other little multi-layer ceramic there just fits with the, about two mil clearance. That's fine. But the other one was standing up. Couldn't lean it over far enough because of the resistors. So we're good to go now. Everything's prepped. Like a brand new ball one, except only better, better, better.
All right, one thing, important thing of note is one of these uh, connections is no longer used. And that connection there was previously a jumper and that corresponds to JP710. So on the board you can see one, two, three, four, five, six, seven are used. And then there's not even a hole for that one. So that's a bit confusing. Maybe I should have just put an empty pad there. But, hey, it's my party and I'll cry if I want to. So uh, that gets left off. The other holes more or less correspond a line up within, say, half a mil. I had to tweak stuff around to make everything fit. And you can see around the high voltage pins, there's an extra margin there. That's to uh, just allow a bit more um, isolation between the ground plane and the pads and traces with a high potential to avoid any possibility of leakage or tracking. Okay, so now comes the fun part. Mating the new boards with the old ones, trying to line up a caterpillar. 5,000 pins at once. And already we've hit a snag. Well, this is gonna be an absolute nightmare. Yay! What I'm going to do is cut them all off more or less flush so we can feed them in one at a time without one over here or something trying to fight us while we're feeding in one over here. So you can see here why this is not an economically viable repair. That's the main reason I did this video to show that amps that are this far gone, generally the best place for them is the parts bin or the bin bin. Otherwise known around here is the fuck it bucket. Here's a mini fucking bucket. Let's try again, shall we? So the trick is, I should have made the pin holes bigger. I should have made the component pads larger. You know, live and learn. I haven't been into circuit board design for very long. This is one of the very early, bir early birds, early boards that I did. And it's just sat on the shelf ever since because I haven't had time to look at it. Still don't, but I'm doing it anyway. You know the problem? I'm not poking my tongue out. In the factory. These would have been link wires before they even snapped the board. So they would have just been put insert, uh, inserted with the Panasert or whatever tool they use to, uh, machine they use to automatically insert the parts and fold the leads over. And then they would have snapped the board and then bent them all in one go. We don't have that luxury because we're making our own board. But there we go. We're in like Flynn. All right. Now I'll sort of eye it up. I might put a bit of a radius in them so we've got some play. Wow. This is harder than I thought it would be. <laughs> When you're repairing these things, usually you replace them one or two at once, not all of them. Well, this is not trivial. <sighs> not trivium. But we got there. Now we've got to do it all over again. <laughs> what I'm going to do is screw those boards together now. If we need to work on stuff, we can work on it. I was going to lay it all flat, but looking at how much of a pain the ass that was, I think I'm going to uh, screw these and work on, say, L shape like that. How's that sound? Good, thought so. Now we'll fix these two boards together with some uh, 6mm long M3 screws. Uh, oh, actually, is that metric? 
No, it's not. I'm going to have to use the old screws. Never mind. Oh, this is a blast from the past. When I took this thing apart, this cat was just rattling around <laughs> in the chassis and someone had soldered it with like bits of mains lead and it was just rolling around in the chassis. Uh, clearly, they thought one of the caps had blown the 47 microfarad, so they thought, let's just put a 470 microfarad across it. That'll, that'll fix the bastard. Just... The way people's mind works, I just, I don't know. I don't know where they hear this shit. <laughs> anyway, it's undone now. So it's a bit of a shame. We had some pretty nice valves in here. Hopefully, hopefully they're still good, but looking at the condition of the sockets and the coloring of those uh, logos, I, I doubt they are. Oh, and this was their bias pot. <laughs> Again, it was just hanging on by wires, just like hanging off the end of the board like that. And pff, I don't know where they found this pot. That's an Alan Bradley. Very, I don't know, probably super old. Looks to be coated in some hermetic sealing stuff. I don't know. Anyway. Well, screw holes line up. That's a win. <laughs> so now I'm just gently going to help these uh, wires through. Not pulling too hard, we'll bend the board. I now go through and solder all of them. Check that they've got adequate adequate clearance on the other side. All right, I didn't put you through the uh, arduous process of relinking all these boards, but it's done. Let's never speak of this again. So there's the whole assembly. I'm going to plug that into the transformer, run away, go to the pub, have a schooner, come back, and if the shop's on fire, uh, I'll deal with it then. <laughs> Now we'll plug it into the transformer. We'll put it through the variac, set it to pretty much zero, which is about six volts AC on the mains. Then we'll just check that all the voltages um, we expect to see, like a couple of millivolts here and there, or at least this right polarity. We'll bring it up to about 24 volts, so one tenth of the mains, and with no load, we should see about, say, one-tenth of the voltage, other than the heaters, because they're serial. We won't see anything like the real voltage there. Uh, but we should be able to see the bias supply and the plate and screen supply for each socket. And if we don't, there's a problem. And if we're drawing excessive current, there's also a problem. So we'll just do our usual start-up procedure, basically, is what I'm getting at. All right, champions! Banish that board, stupid board. <laughs> Here's the janky ass test setup that you have to do with these things. We've got the power transformer, hardwired to stuff, switch, light, fucking tag strips. Uh, unbolted the output transformer to get it close to this way on the chassis so we can actually plug that in. I've got it plugged into the variac. Got the variac turned off. Now I do. Uh, we've got it set to. I've checked passively that everything's. Well, not, I haven't done anything completely fucking stupid. Let's see if I've just done something minorly stupid. Um, so I've done all my passive tests. Everything lines up to what it should. Given it a little sip of juice, and it's uh, it's drawing bugger all current. Um, and I've jacked it up to 24 volts AC input and it's still draw drawing bugger or current. So, 
we're going to click the Variac on and just go through and check that we've got the voltages that we hope to have where we expect to have them. Right, so testing these things is a pain in the ass at the very best of times, let alone when you've rebuilt the whole thing and designed your own friggin' circuit board like a madman. So, so uh, Variac on, drawing in rush of 40 amp, uh, 40 watts down to six, 6 watts. Now, the power when it's off is 6.1 watts. Turn it on, 6.3 watts. And that is at 14 volts AC. Let's take it up to 24. You know, we're sitting at six watts unloaded. Click the amp on, 6.6 .6 watts. So nothing, because everything's just charged up and sitting there, not really drawing current. So just double check our voltage there. Still sitting at 24 volts AC on the mains input. So you've got DC heaters to the first three valves, the 12AX7s. They are all in series, given 36 volts total for the three by 12. That's what the 12 in 12 AX7 stands for. They're wired in, uh, normally you can wire them in either parallel or series, whether or not you use uh, link pin four and five. In this case, they're done in uh, series on each valve and then a string of three in series, 36 volts DC that, that it gets. Uh, so if any one of those valves has a failed heater, they all go out. The EL84s are in a bank of four, again, seriesed, but they get AC. Uh, so we can't measure uh, on each socket what it is because the ones in the middle obviously won't have any. So let's just check on the feed, which is on the uh, 3 ohm resistors. 3.9 volts AC. 3.5 volts AC. Now you might think, hang on, that's already the right voltage, but no, it's not because it's not a parallel heater and it's not center balanced. It's um, it's running at about one tenth, so you'd have about 36 volts across that AC. So that's sitting at 36, 39 ish, and uh, that would probably sag down a little bit under load. So what we'll check, we'll just go through our DC voltages. So we'll go pin uh, one, 89 volts, and pin six, 90 volts, 89, 90, coppers chasing me, 90 volts, 90 volts. Now that might seem high, but you've got to remember this tiny little transformer on this thing. It sags heavily under load. Go pin nine and pin seven on the EL eighty fours. Yep. We're just checking that voltages are present at the moment. There's no shorts or all weird behaviour. Now we'll check our grids. Pin two on the EL eighty fours. Minus two volts. Minus two. All right, now I've wound that trim pot all the way down as far as it'll go. So let's bring it up a little bit again. This is not fun working under a multimeter. So on pin two, we're just turning the trim pot, just checking that it responds. Helps if you're actually in there. So we should be turning the bias point up at the moment, which means the voltage is going less negative. So it's approaching zero. And that's what's happening. So at full, well, what would be full dissipation, 1.6 volts minus 1.6. And it goes more negative as you turn it down and goes to 1.8. So the trim pot's working. Let's just check our other pins and just see if there's uh, any weirdness going on or anything that shouldn't be there. Well, check it out. You look away five minutes, you look back and the rig's even more janky. <laughs> so I've got these two meters across the primary, blah, 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 as usual. 
Just disconnect them and confirm the measurements. Sometimes the meters interact. So 95.3 ohms and 123.9 ohms. You can see it goes a little bit out, but bugger all. But uh, we've got a probe to check voltages. We're gonna fire it up. Flip these over to volts, and we'll be able to read the dissipation of the output stage as the valves warm up. I've got a new set of uh, EL84s in there. I just don't want, if there's any issues with the other ones, I don't want them to be sending me down rabbit holes. I want to know with a set of known good ones what we're dealing with and if there are any issues. So drawing 15 watts from the wall. And we're at about 100 volts. We should start to see conduction soon. In the form of a voltage drop across the primary. It's a 17 watts, 18 watts. And we're seeing some action. And up they go. 20 watts, 22 watts. We're starting to get signal. Scratchy signal, but signal. 25 watts. Some pretty hectic imbalance there between the two sides. Looks like one side's trying to run away. Let's check the voltage on the grid. Minus 4.8. Minus 4.8, it's the same on both sides. Could just be in balance as they warm up. They're just not warming up at the exact same rate, so nothing to stress about at these low voltages. Everything's a bit out. Pot needs a good clean. Channel switching's working. Oh, I'm thinking stuff's getting pretty hot pretty quick. Uh, and then I forgot that my bias mod required snipping out of the bias resistor on the uh, existing board. So that's R64. Let me show you in desk cam. So see here, you've got your negative supply here. You've got R63. And R64, they form a divider. And then you've got your bias feed. Your bias feed from there goes directly into the 220K resistor, well, bias feed resistors into the uh, grid stoppers. So, what we've done is hung off this point, this circuit. So that's that point, 220K, 220K. And we've got a 27 and a 10K to ground. But that requires snipping out the existing resistor R64 goodbye and we'll rely on the R27 uh, sorry the R17 on my schematic the R17 and the RV1 to be the bottom half of the divider we'll see where that lands us alright so we fired it up again we're drawing about 20 watts from the wall we're just starting to conduct now alright that's looking a bit more sane <laughs> we're Let's push it up to about 180 volts, we've got 40 watts now. And we've got our bias sense resistors that we mentioned early, earlier. So we've got eight or nine milliamps, 13 milliamps, 13 milliamps, 12 milliamps. Let's come up to 11. So that's looking a bit more logical. Noticing a bit of hum. You gotta remember it's also open on the deck with switch mode switch mode LEDs above it. So let's give it some more juice. We're on 50, 60 watts now. We're sitting at 193 volts. We'll go up to 200. 17 milliamps. 
18, 19, 17. So remember that's taken into account the screen current as well because that's cathode current. But I'd say overall everything's looking pretty good so I'm just going to have a quick listen with the guitar. Alright, so we just added yet another test lead for the chassis ground because there's no ground connection other than the jacks on this thing to the actual chassis where the actual earth actually is, actually. <laughs> so where was I? Yes, we're going to have a little play. And the most harebrained test rig ever. I'll show you in a sec with the Panasonic what it looks like when you're not in the overhead view. It works, it's alive. Fuck, it works. What do we do now? Do I have to go back to real work? <sighs> pretty dull. That's because treble is the last knob. I thought it was reverb. Uh, <laughs> that's better. Okay, so it goes treble, then middle, then bass. Everything all the time. Reverb, which we'll turn down for the moment because it's not plugged in. Pre and post, so that's the lead channel and normal. No. Oh, well. Sounds like a uh, classic 30. It's just humming because I'm standing right in front of it. Just check the lead channel. Uh, pre and post, turn post down, press the button. Channel two, pre. Pots need a good clean. Didn't expect no problems first go on this one, <laughs> but it worked. This was, uh, I think, the first circuit board I ever designed, and it's just sat there ever since, not being used. And it works, so that's cool. Uh, we'll carry on doing the usual measurements and go on to the next project, I guess, which might be a real job. So in hindsight, champions, I should have made this value bigger. That works out to 37K maxed out. The original was 33, but the original was way too hot. So I probably should have put like a, I don't know, a uh, 33 in there and then had this in addition to that. So I might do that, might change it out. But overall, that's the schematic of what I drew in KiCad, KiCad, however you want to say it. And um, it worked. First go. Kind of disappointing. <laughs> so here's another view of the rig. <laughs> That's just standing up in midair. It's got a couple of cork blocks behind it just supporting it. And uh, there's the, well, an empty new board. And there's the destroyed old board. So uh, that's going all right now. We'll just make that one change to the bias circuit. And I think we're ready to do some measurements and then pack this one away. Got to give the uh, 
shows you a bit of a clean up but all in all I'd say mission kind of successful first go all right so I did test the old valves the old mallards and they were okay for a little while but then one side started drifting and and uh, jumping up and down in dissipation <coughs> compared to the other so uh swap them out i'll just stick them in the fucker bucket as well it's a shame because they're not cheap but uh we've got the new electro harmonics in there and that's been nice and stable for about an hour now i've just been playing and rocking out here after everyone's gone home just you know remembering how shit my repertoire is <laughs> so i see a lot of guys go my amps bias to 20 milliamps per valve yeah, that's not a dissipation measurement. That's a current measurement. That could be 20 milliamps at 3 volts, which is fuck all. Or it could be 20 milliamps at 800 volts, which is significant. <laughs> so you need to refer to it in watts, because that's a dis power dissipation, power. Milliamps is not power. So you need to do the calc. So say we're going, that's, say, 20 milliamps, that's... Let's pretend that's the plate current. That's the cathode current. We've got the plate current here over the primary of the transformer. I can't remember the measurements. I'll do that later when I'm testing everything. So say you got, so it's in amps, 0 0.2, 0 point, sorry, 0 0.02 amps, 20 milliamps. You multiply that by the plate to cathode. The cathode voltage is negligible in this case because it's only one ohm from ground. 372, that's another uh, EL84 abuser. So we're running 7.4 watts on the hottest valve. And it's more like, say, reduce, I don't know, one watt-ish for the screen. So around six watts. So we're running about 50% at the moment because it's 12 watts for an EL84. So that's good, 50%. That's all the way down, mind you. So that's with the, I've put a subbed in a 33 ohm resistor on the, the bias circuit I showed you earlier. So I might go further than that. I might put a 47 there or something. Um, just so we've got some range in that pot. And uh, it can be on the colder side because these things cook. And let's face it, if you are after supreme world ending tone, um, you probably wouldn't be in the market for a PV Classic 30. They do sound great for the value. They are one of the best sounding amps in their field. But if your primary concern was tone and reliability, you probably go for something a bit more high end. So let's just bias this one a bit cooler, just like with the Blues Juniors and that. Um, they come in at like 110, 120%, and it's a fixed bias amp. It varies with, uh, it's, yeah, the fixed bias is the voltage, all right? It's, yeah, it's annoying. Uh, a lot of newcomers get super confused by that. It's fixed bias, but it's adjustable. Um, but the dissipation changes when you play heavier. That's why you need the margin. And like, yes, that's why. It's like trying to learn the English language. I've got an Italian mate. Hello, Carlo, if you're watching. He tells us all the idiosyncrasies about the English language. We don't know because we've grown up around it. So to us, it's no biggie. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty messed up language and sometimes electronics can be the same. <laughs> So anyway, I think we're happy with this one. I'm gonna leave this video here. I'm gonna put it back in the box. I'm gonna do some final testing and then I might do some little playing samples afterwards. It's just gonna sound like a classic 30 basically because I didn't really do anything to the circuit. I just transferred it to a new board. But you know, for shits and giggles, we'll, we'll do that as well. So anyway, thanks for watching champions. See ya on the next one.